Well, thank you once again. It's a massive privilege, it really is, uh, to be with you and uh, to uh, speak to a, <clears throat> a, a, a concern really on my heart. Um, uh, some of you will know I, I help uh, with leaders and their teams uh, now. Uh, but the, the reason for that is because I'm passionate about seeing people saved. Uh, so it's not something like I'm a leader, big L. It's just that I'm a, a pastor who's passionate about seeing people saved. And leadership is one of those ways to help take that forward in churches. And so the subject we're looking at this morning is growing a believer's church. And uh, that's something I'm, you know, how can we help uh, you reach people with the gospel? Now, the outcome's with God, isn't it? The outcome is absolutely with God. But it's our responsibility to bring the gospel to people, to persuade, to win, uh, to connect, to engage, knowing that it's a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit for anybody to be born again. And in this passage, Acts 16, uh, those elements are very evident. Uh, here we have that reading we've just had. Uh, it's, it's probably not a passage you preach on, is it? Because it's got all this travel log and you go like, well, who knows where Bithynia is? You know, who, ca- who cares? Um, but actually in this passage is the preparation for the gospel to come to Europe. And it is an, it's a significant little section where two unusual things happen. The Holy Spirit says no. Uh, normally the Holy Spirit says go. And it's the Christians who are lagging behind. Come on Christians, catch up with where God is. Uh, you know, I want you to go to Gentiles. I want you to go, no, 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 no. Look, yeah, no that's where I am, come on. In, here, in this section, and if you were reading it and you had that sort of, you had your radar up, you, you, it would really hit you. The Holy Spirit says no, twice. So that when he says, go, we realise straight away this is God calling us. See, There's two negatives. In order to emphasise the positive, God wants the gospel to come to Europe. And God has gone ahead. And God is at work. He was then. He is now. The Holy Spirit has not been withdrawn back to heaven. He is still God the Holy Spirit. Sovereign acting in our part of the world. And the encouragement that God is active and we are active. So they conclude, and got up at once, to preach the gospel to them. And to them is us. And we were as uh, ignorant, biased, prejudiced, living these uh, nasty, brutal, short lives, as Thomas Hobbes put it, back then as, as often today. But the gospel came and did its work then. And then, as you know, uh, Acts 16, we're going to look at it very briefly a little, in a little moment of time. Uh, three converts. Um, here, here is a local church being formed. And here are three of the stories of people who became Christian believers. And Luke gives us uh, some real insights there. But I just want to step back for a moment. Because when you feel the, the urgency of the task... And the magnitude of the task. Hundreds of millions of people in our part of the world. uh, Many of them saying, we've done Christianity. We've got the t-shirt. It's now stored up in the loft. We're not bothered anymore. Thank you very much. Leave us alone. When when you're faced with hundreds of millions of people like that. uh, And churches facing the demographic of a lot of Christian believers now in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Knowing in the next 30 years they'll go to heaven. And they're not being replaced underneath. There are not as many converts coming through. So churches are facing a a, a demographic time bomb uh, in some ways. I mean, the Anglican church particularly is facing a massive demographic problem where something like 50 to 60 percent of Anglican attendees will be, you know, will have died in the next 20 odd years. It's a massive problem. We, We can feel the urgency and we can then end up pushing evangelism in our church and making people constantly feel like useless failures. So so you know if you do a sermon on evangelism, most Christians go, oh no, not another sermon. It's going to beat me up and make me feel the failure that I know I already am. So I just want to step back, and I thank God for this book. I didn't read it. I didn't like the title. When this book first came out, I I left it on a bookshelf for ages and ages. Thank God it's Monday. I don't like the title of a book like that. It can't be a very good book. So I left it. 
And how stupid that was, because it's a cracking book. Mark Green wrote this one, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. Just emphasising, I think, where we need to start, that we are equipping God's people for a whole life of service. They're not little tools we're using. We're not the kind of chess player and they're the little pawns we're moving around on our board in order our church to grow. We are equipping God's people for works of service out there. We we tend to read that Ephesians, well, equipping for God's people for works of service within the gathered church. Whereas, well, that's true, of course, but it's, again, both and. (laughs) It's in the church and outside of the church, equipping God. I I, I really help... Help me get away from this, uh, what are you doing for God? You're either earning money to pay me or you're telling people about Jesus. And if you're not doing either of those two things, you're a waste of space. Now, nobody would say it like that, but that's the feel. When you put evangelism high up on the agenda, you can slip into a kind of utilitarianism, which things only have value if they lead to that result that I want, which is to see people save and the church grow. And this was a great... It was a great kind of comeback to a much bigger Christian worldview. And some in the, there's some who have a reformed soteriology, but don't have a fully worked out reformed worldview. I'm so grateful for being able to learn from, uh, you know, sort of great believers in, 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 in the past, in that sort of reformed tradition and Warfield and Hodge and then, Murray and Schaefer, which said, look, you, evangelism is, is urgently, seriously important, but it's part of a bigger thing. And Mark Green just captures that. And again, uh, next one, please. He's, he's more recently, he's done this one, fruitfulness on the front line, God's people serving him. And what he's basically arguing for is, look, we must make Sunday and Monday work for each other. We, we must not sort of say, have this sacred secular divide that Sunday's the sacred day, Monday's the day where you go and earn the money or do what you have to do, just do it. And the really important things happen in church. And the only thing that really counts is church stuff and telling people about Jesus. And, and he's saying, oh, hold on a minute. Let's, let's stand back and say, no, these are God's people. A little diagram that they use, I think it's a helpful one, LICC in London. Uh, the gathered church then becomes the scattered church. But the scattered church are not just out there as evangelism machines. They're God's people serving him in all kinds of ways. And those things have intrinsic value. They don't have to be justified. Well, you know, I play hockey. And of course, I do that so that uh, I, as long as I make sure I, I speak about Jesus every week, that's why I do it. No, I play hockey because I love running around. I love a team sport. I meet some mates. I do pray for them. Many of them do talk to me. But I don't need to justify it. It's like, how many converts have come through the hockey team, Ray? Well, the answer is none. What a useless failure you are. No, well, I've had a lot of fun playing, you know. So God's people are out there, even today, serving him. And, of course, as they serve him, they're serving them as whole life disciples, They've not compartmentalised their lives, saying, this is the secular bit where I play sport. I came across a very sad example. Uh, a Christian sport worker was telling me once he was going to do a sports quiz in a church in a town in the Midlands. And he got excited because he heard that the minister uh, uh, played squash. He said, great, he'll know loads of guys uh, who could, he could invite to the sports quiz with the evangelistic talk. And he thought, that'd be great. And he knew, like, I kind of do that thing. I get a load of mates along, stuff like that. Said, great. And, and he talked to the, the minister and he said, you know, now how many people are you bringing along? He said, oh, excuse me. I do not mix work and pleasure. I, why would I bring any of the people I play squash with? You know, it's like, well, that's not what we're talking about. We're saying you are serving God on Sunday and you are serving God on Monday around the school gate or even in the squash court. Uh, I'm sure you can hit a squash ball <laughs> And play with somebody in a way that is an attractive, welcoming, friendship building, maybe relationship thing. And no doubt there will be opportunity. But don't. And, and we need to give Christians out there in the workplace, in the school gate, in the home, this bigger sense. God is with them where they are. Then we can then start talking about equipping them 
for evangelising where they are. If you start with equipping them for evangelism, they will feel beat up on. And most of the time, they'll nod when you talk, but actually in their hearts, they're going, no, no. See, that's what, you know that, don't you? You you do that, but you deep down think, no, no. Whereas if you start talking about God is with you around the school gate, and maybe that that young mum you saw who she was a bit flustered with her children you just got alongside her. why don't you come around for some coffee and she didn't she just came around for some coffee and there was no evangelistic opportunity but you were building a relationship who knows where god will lead see when christians realize that god is with them doing that then you can start saying and the second point we're going to make is you can then start saying equipping people for a whole life of evangelism if you don't start with whole life service and you just go straight for the evangelism thing, you, you will end up... Some people love sermons like that for a while, don't they? Oh, you yeah, really give it me, right? You know, that's what I needed. But you're trying to equip people for 30 or 40 years. You cannot punch them in the jaw every few weeks without them going, stop it, I don't want to be hit any longer. See? So actually we need this massive whole life serving God. Then you can start saying... Okay, let's talk about whole life of evangelism. Now, Acts 16 is a, is a really helpful passage. Um, a, a massively significant talk that Tim Keller did, I don't know, somewhere around 2000, where he, he just panned back on Acts 16 and said, look, if you look what Luke is doing, he's quite brilliant. He is showing that the gospel can reach the parts that religion can't reach. A Jewish man would thank God that he was not born a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. So he said, okay, let's show you the gospel can reach women, slaves, and Gentile. The gospel can change lives in a way that religion can't. And so he gives us these three stories. So they're pattern stories. And, and what he says, it's not prescriptive, okay? But it is suggestive. It's more than descriptive. It's a tricky thing in the book of Acts. Is this something we ought to do? Or is this just something that just was a one-off? Well, most things are neither of those things. They're kind of suggestive. They're thought-provoking. And you go, that's interesting. And here Luke, as Luke does quite brilliantly, Luke, Luke is a master when he tells his stories. He picks out things for us to learn from. And three things here. You notice that the word is prominent in all three stories. Even the slave girl, the demons say, these men are telling you how to be saved. So the word is there, but it's kind of dominant in one in a way that it's different in the others. And, and Keller went on to suggest that there's a woman reached by word ministry, Lydia. And even uh, cuts us preachers down to size. This is really, really important, this, isn't it? Even as Paul is preaching, it is the Lord who opens her heart. Mm-hmm. And we need to hear that. Okay? You imagine uh, back in the day, you'd go, oh, we've got Billy Graham coming. Well, it's only Billy Graham. He can't open anybody's heart. Or it could be John Piper or whoever your favourite is. He's only a man and he's preaching a divine message. But unless the power of God is at work, the divine message will come across a hard heart. But the Lord opens her heart, the sovereign grace of God. She is born again into God's family and then the outward confession of faith through baptism. And uh, this woman is a God-fearer. It's a technical phrase. She was not born a Jewess. Now, we don't know her backstory. We're only told, as it were, her coming to faith. She was in a religious meeting. She's a rich woman. She's a religious woman. And in that meeting place, she becomes a believer. She hears the message. She believes it. But we don't know. Who who introduced her to it in the first place? We don't know that sort of stuff. Luke chooses not to tell us here, but she would have had a backstory. Now, a whole load of people get saved in a place where there is a word dominant context. It might be a, a meal with a message. It might be a Sunday preaching. It might be some rally. There's a word dominant context. But how do people get to that place? Well, it's normally through some kind of invitation. Somebody asks them, to come along to hear the word. Some people do just Google it and they find it and they turn up. But that's extremely rare. Some people get saved by reading the word. My friend Mark Troughton, 
Uh, some of you know Mark, pastor in York. He was converted reading the French Bible in France when he was studying French. That was his gospel word came through reading the Bible. And that's fantastic. And that happens. Some people read a track that was left on the, on the floor somewhere. You know, you get those stories. They're tr- but they're rare. Most people come to faith because somebody asks them to something. Here's some research next time. This is uh, Dave Bennett. You've, some of you have heard me quote this before. A fantastic bit of research that Dave Bennett did around the turn of the millennia. It's a little bit dated now, but he found as he, he did an in-depth survey of nearly 400 adult converts. How did they become Christians? And he said that 92% of new adult Christians had a prior friendship with a Christian. And second only to praying for them, 86% said giving an invitation was the most significant way Christians had helped. That's an amazing piece of research. That people becoming Christians in our culture is normally they've already had a relationship with a Christian. So you say to the Christians in the church, the people most likely to convert already know you. You just need the courage to start inviting them to things. Now, as I've talked around over the last few years, one or two guys go, oh, it's very old-fashioned, it's very old hat, you know, we, we, you know, this invite them to church stuff, it feels like something out of the 1950s. But actually, Bennett says, no, that is how people get saved. Uh, and it may not just necessarily be to a church, there are all kinds of things where they hear the word. And, and if we want to see our church to grow, we need to create a culture where Christians start inviting people to things. Not badgering them, not being stupid, using wisdom, but nevertheless having the courage to say, Would you, I'd love it if you could come too. And we, uh, we start with carol services, because almost anything that moves will come to a carol service. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, if, and once the Christians break, break through that pain barrier, and not put a leaflet through a door, but actually give a personal invite... They will experience what you experience, the high of a friend saying yes, and then the normal disappointment of eight saying no. And they'll go, that's that. But they're in the game then, aren't they? They're no longer in the stands watching. They're on the pitch playing. And when they bring friends, they really want you to be your, at your best preaching about Jesus. They will pray more when they've got friends next to them, won't they? And they all of a sudden go, wow, this is so serious, Ray. This is really important. We really want the welcome to be good. We want the sound to worship. You know, that everything, because my friend and I've been praying for this person for five years and they've come for the very first time. And all of a sudden you go, right, that's great. You're now in the game. So that is the easiest step. Getting people to invite people to things. That's the easiest step. And we need to create a culture where it's normal for Christians to invite friends to... Now, it may be to special events. It may be to normal church. But it's massive. It's massively significant. But then the second uh, thing goes on to... We we use this phrase, come and see. Uh, We create an invite culture, if you like. Where it's normal to invite people to things. But also then the slave girl, she's not reached like that. Why not? Because she's nobody's friend. There's no, there's no friendship. You, you, it'd be odd, isn't it? It's like, are you best friends with the prostitutes that live in your... Whoa, hold on a minute. What do you mean? I don't even, are there any prostitutes in our town? Of course there are. You just don't know them. Nobody knows them because they're friendless. It's the same with the drug addicts. They, they don't have friends. They just have people who they use and who use them. So how do you reach people who've got... Life problems. Well, here it is. You couldn't get worse than this, could you? She's a slave two times over. She's demon-possessed. And she's economically oppressed. And, okay, that's unique circumstance. You see, it's a unique thing about her. But there's a lesson there. She's reached by compassionate deed. Now, clearly the word is there, but Luke emphasizes that compassionate intervention in her life. A relationship has formed. Paul can't stand it any longer. He, as it were, by the power of God, breaks the chains of her oppression. He knows it's going to be costly. For him, it costs a severe beating. But that's how you reach slave girls and their equivalent. There's some kind of costly intervention. Now, what you can do as an individual, what you can do as a church, may be limited. It's no good thinking you can become the UK social services with just 35 members in your church. You can't. The government can't do this with their hundreds of billions of uh, tax revenue. You cannot solve all the social problems. But you could help somebody. It could start with 
some flowers and cards and maybe some meals for the, the newly widowed lady down the bottom of the road. Something you could do as an individual. Or it could be something you can organise as a church. Maybe something you can do to help some group of people that you might not otherwise reach. And it's no good trying to compare what you do with what somebody else does because everybody's resources and circumstances are different. But it's something to touch somebody where they have a felt need. Now, it is not the deed doing the evangelism. The deed creates the relationship over which the word comes. But no deed, no relationship, no word. It's the deed that builds the relationship. Now, the, the challenge is, and this is where churches are much better at it than, if I can put it like this, Christian charities. The great challenge for a, a non-church Christian charity is to keep word and deed together. So some of those great Christian charities of the Victorian era who have done great deed ministry have now lost word ministry. Think of like Bernardo's or Spurgeon's even, where deed and word are now quite far removed. Whereas church is doing something of this, they're constantly saying, let's keep word and deed close together. And let's not be embarrassed about word and deed. The deed builds the relationship, but we're done, it's done in the name of the Lord and, and the word is not far away. And it seems to me that churches that have done some of this have maintained that tension more effectively than sort of Christian corporate charity things find it hard to do. Uh, they don't want to sort of offend and so on and so forth. and so It's a challenge, but care and serve. There are two things that churches can organise. So come back, remember yesterday, organism, organisation and organic. You can organise some events to which people can invite friends. And sometimes that can get a lot of people in connection with the word. And you can do some ministry it may be a mums and toddlers group. It could be something to old folks, an old folks lunch club. There's old loads, and you're already probably doing it. And, but there's another area which you can't organise, because you can't organise an earthquake in the middle of the night, can you? <laughs> See, it's life. It's life. It's just life. Next one, yeah. Life happens, and in life circumstances, there's often an opportunity to go and tell but you can't organize this but you can prepare people for and what i just want to home in on today is not so much what we can organize um as it were like top down you know we're the organizers of things so much as from bottom up can we equip can we create a a mindset change a culture change amongst the christians in the church to say God is with you on your front line and you'd be amazed how many opportunities he'll give you if you are willing to trust him because most Christians if you ask them how often do you speak about Jesus to anybody you know and the answer is not very often at all despite all our input all our exhortations all our preaching actually the average Christian speaks about Jesus very very infrequently and we need to create a culture change and say God is with you. The Holy Spirit is at work. And if we could help but prepare you and encourage you and nurture a culture of prayerfulness amongst ourselves about lost people and our role in reaching them, maybe our churches could see something of a movement that begins to change the way they think about outsiders. Most churches are pretty protective, but we could become more, as it were, aware of what God is doing out there. Uh, Jim Collins, I mentioned uh, yesterday, he, he wrote uh, that Good to Great book, and in it, he talks about the power of the flywheel. And what he says, when you're trying to get a church from inward focused to beginning to become much more conscious that we have good news for lost people out there, it's like moving a massive flywheel. To start with, you're kind of pushing so hard to get anybody to pray for anybody who's lost. And then to talk to anybody who's lost, it feels like you're going, no, and you're pushing all that energy in and it's going, no. But after a while, the flywheel begins to move. And you start, people come to premier saying, oh, I had a fantastic conversation on the train on the way in today. I just, will you pray for this guy? He's called Bill and he told me his life story and I told him my, my hunger to pray for him. And somebody says, well, I had an amazing opportunity. And, and you see the flywheel's happening and then Christians are beginning to encourage each other. 
So what you're doing is just putting a little bit more energy, but you're not having to move the whole thing. But that, how long does it take to move that flywheel? Well, in my experience, about 15 years. At least that before the church began to see it as normal to even invite people and pray for people. 15 years before that began to work. But now it's working. The flywheel, every now and then needs a bit of a shove again. But most of the time, it's just now normal that we pray for lost people. It's normal that we talk to one another in our home groups about people on our hearts. And we ask one another, you, you mentioned your auntie. Uh, and I, I haven't forgotten her. Well, how's it going with your aunt? You know, that kind of thing. So let's, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this going and telling. So how are we going to help each other? How can we equip for what we call organic go and tell rather than organised? So we're not now talking about what the church organises, but how the church can equip for this organic, this personal, spiritual, individual going and telling. Well, one thing that really helped prepare our folks was... What's called the Evangelism Styles Questionnaire? Which is like, oh no, what's that? Well, it came out of this book, Becoming a Contagious Christian. Um, Bill Hybels, Mark Miltelberg uh, wrote a book about how you could become more of a con- you know, Christian that shares your faith. And it, it's a dated book now. And, um, but in it came this thing, and I've got copies. If you want to see me afterwards, I've got some copies. You can, you can go online and find it. But what it did, it, it was one of those things that Brits hate to do. So there's a questionnaire, and there's about, I don't know, 75 questions, and you, you have to give a 0, 1, 2, 3 is the art you like. For the first question, is uh, I like to be direct and get to the point and say it as it is. Is that not, not at all, you know, 1, 2, or 3? And for me, I'm like, 1, I beat around the bush all the time. My wife, Jenny, 3, 3, I'm straight to the point, you know. And you just go through it like that. And Brits hate that kind of thing, and men... But there's a few men, you can see one or two of the sort of type A's say, OK, what's the pass mark? How can I win this test? <laughs> well, it's not that kind of thing. It's not a test. It's a diagnostic. And there are six different categories. And eventually you think, you know, am I a direct person like Peter? Do I like a good discussion like Paul? Am I an inviter like Andrew? Have I got a testimony that I like to tell like the man born blind? Am I the kind of person who just loves doing things for people like Dorcas? Am I just someone who just loves encouraging people like Barnabas? And we did this thing as a whole church. We got everybody to talk about it. And people are like, it's okay to be who I am then. It's okay to be who I am. Because God can use somebody like me, and we're not all the same. God has got a huge team and we're all very different. And there's somebody like the, in the Bible like me that God used. Whereas, as you know, there kind of tends to be the, the, the people with amazing testimony or the people who are just good with a, you know, good with a, you know, sales technique type thing. They're the ones that get the platform. And ordinary Christians go, well, I'm, not, I'm not like that. I mean, Roger Carswell is a great friend and he's brilliant. But he totally intimidates me. Because he has this thing like every day in his life he speaks to somebody about Jesus. And if he hasn't spoken to somebody by Jesus at half past nine at night, he goes to the local takeaway and makes sure he does. Well, he's like, hey, Raj, I just, I'm not, I'm not, I just admire that, but I'm not like that. You, you just don't, and he said, well, come on, Ray, you can learn. And I go, oh. look, when I did door-to-door work when I was a young Christian, I wish they were out, you know. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so look, Raj, that's not me. But it was great to know Rog Cars was on the team. And there are others like Rog in our church. But there's others who could really do with a one-to-one and they'll spend hours. one And they're great at that. But don't put them in front of a bunch of strangers. So evangelism starts question. Now we started there to say, God made you the way you are. And whoever you are, he can use you. Because look at people in the Bible who are like you, who God used. So just a kind of little, just get people thinking about it. Just like, like, trust God. He's not made a mistake in making you the way you are. He can use you. And then we moved on to get people to start telling your story, learning to tell your story and tell his story. Uh, for most people, the only experience they ever have of telling, giving their testimony is when they join the church. And uh, back in the day in Warboys, uh, I came before the church. I had to s- tell my story. Then I went out the room. Then they voted. 
whether I was in or out. And uh, then I came back in to be told the good news I was in. Um, but it was, it was quite intimidating. And of course, the bigger the church, it gets incredibly scary. I mean, you, you imagine getting up in front of, I don't know, 500 people and giving your testimony. It's just incredibly scary. So most people don't get much help in sharing their story. But, you know, sharing your story is massive. Uh, Can I just, next one. Bennett found this. Someone sharing their story came second of all these hundreds of converts out of 22 topics which could have influenced a person becoming a Christian. In fact, they, they found this, that hearing how to become a Christian from your friend was more significant than hearing how to become a Christian from a preacher up the front. That's really significant, isn't it? That actually, if if you want to see converts, an ordinary Christian telling that person how God worked in their life is more significant than you you describing that. It's something like, ah. Now, they're not saying, God saved me this way, he'll only save you that. It's not, it's just saying, but God worked in my life, this is how he did it. For some, it will be, you know, I, I never, I never remember a time when I wasn't a Christian. Mr. Schaefer said that. I never remember a time when I didn't trust Jesus. I was brought him a lovely home. But I did have to make some decisions in my teenage years to follow Jesus. And I've been following him now for 80 years, and I've had my highs and my lows, but he's never forsaken me. Two minutes, jargon free. Now, the person you're talking to might say, well, that's some very, very different for me. But they will understand that God works in our lives. And many Christians have not shared their story since they were converted with anybody else. And yet, God uses the sharing of what he's done in my life to touch other people's lives. So, if we want to help Christians be ready on their front line, we at least ought to get them to think about, could I share my story Two minutes, jargon-free. Most Christians, it's not that short. It's, you know, they could talk for England. You know you're in trouble when they say, well, some around time, around 1953, you know, and you're, uh uh-oh, it's going to be a long story. My son says, look, if it's a long story, start towards the end, you know. (laughs) But you go, oh, no, 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 I don't want about, okay, 1953, long time ago. And then, and you know, uh, it's often not jargon-free. There is a, it's an awful, I mean, washed in the blood of the lamb, that sort of stuff. But even beyond that, you know, names. I was reading the prophet Isaiah. Well, it may have been true for you, but they don't know even I. They know, Who's Isaiah? Never heard of him. So can you make it jargon free, accessible, intelligible? And then train people into telling his story. A, 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 an explanation of who Jesus is and what he's done. And again, most Christians get pretty confused about that i just become a christian my best mate john gave me a book by dr lloyd jones it was a lovely little booklet actually but it started with the word propitiation it was one of lloyd jones sermons from romans three and i I couldn't say this word for the life of me i was just like i don't even know how to say that word you know i've been a christian about about two weeks what's this word mean he said, oh it means that jesus took the blame oh right i've got that oh that's amazing yeah i've got that and then he introduced me over time into jargon but could i share his story now you know all kinds of ways of doing it and i, I don't want to be technique driven we don't want to every little we're not like you know how jehovah's witnesses do that every now and then especially if they come to your house because you ask them really difficult questions they have to get the manual out don't they read it <laughs> oh is there a, right but we don't want christians to be like that like little machines but having something that they can, that's accessible, just helps them at that point. You know, I didn't expect to be a prisoner, and I didn't expect there to be an earthquake, and I didn't expect a jailer just about to kill himself. And I didn't have to say, oh, hold on, I've got to think about this for a while now. What did the preachers, a few months ago, we did this training, and I can't remember, sorry, jailer, do you hold the dagger for a few more minutes? <laughs> you know, it wasn't like that, was it? He preached to him Jesus. Straight away, he knew where to go. He preached Jesus. And we know, like, we need to be sensitive. Like, where are people? What will they find helpful? Could I explain? Now, you can do some of that. And it's not about a test. It's about giving people, as it were, equipping them. Giving them, as it were, the weaponry that the Holy Spirit uh, wants to use. And there's a challenge here. This is uh, the next slide. Uh, again, this is Keller. Uh, 
He said, if you look at sort of evangelism in the New Testament, you know, you don't get many exhortations for Christians to go and evangelize. You just don't. They just did. And who did they evangelize? He said, what you, if you have a careful study, what you find is they evangelize what he calls their household, their oikos. That you get a man converted, like this jailer, and, and he gets all his family to come and hear. And some of them get converted as they hear. And he tells his circle. And his circle might be a man running a household. Don't think nuclear family, although that would be great, because many dads these days don't tell their children about the Lord Jesus. They let it, leave it to their wives. Or leave it to the church. Whereas he said, no, the Christian's like, no, I'm going to I'm going to evangelize my oikos, my household. It may be some servants. It may be some part-time workers. It may be my aunties. I'm looking after my great aunt. You know, and so it's a whole group of people that I evangelize. The people I work with. You know, he said, that, that happened naturally. Christians sharing good news within their, their extended oikos, their circle. Now he said there's only two reasons why it would not happen. One is there is such a conflict in your life between your life and your and your word that people will not listen to you. You know, you're talking about Jesus who died for our sins on the cross and your touchy, arrogant, judgmental, tell dirty jokes, they're just not going to listen. There's a conflict. The other re- reason is if you're a coward. Because Jesus would normally crop up. If you were living close to Jesus, you wouldn't, couldn't help but speak about him. And I'm hopeless at this. One of my sons-in-law, he works on the radio. Uh, he works with uh, a guy called Chris Evans. I've already told you that, see? And I tell others, I've got a friend of my brother-in-law, son-in-law works with, he works on the Chris Evans program. I drop that name in because I know people know about Chris Evans. But I don't do that with Jesus. Why? Because I'm a coward. And I have to take myself to task and say... Ray, you've built these relationships, but actually, what do often the early Christians pray for? Boldness. And that is missing. Now, boldness is not brashness. Boldness is not arrogance. Boldness is that quiet courage that speaks about Jesus because it's normal to do so. We went to church on Sunday. We had a great time hearing more about Jesus, the saviour of the world. Graham Daniels, that Christian support there, is brilliant on this. He says, you, you, Jesus and a question. That's his little phrase. Just be normal. Jesus and a question. I went to church, heard about Jesus, the saviour of the world. Have you ever been to church and heard about Jesus, the saviour of the world? And they go, well, actually, when I was a boy. So this last Christmas, uh, Tom Jones, BBC Two, did a gospel thing. And all of a sudden, I found out that Tom Jones, the singer, went to a Presbyterian church in Wales when he was a boy. And he heard songs about Jesus. And he knew a lot more about Jesus than ever I was aware. It's Tom Jones. So Tom Jones, a singer. He had... And so you talked to him about Jesus and the, the girl uh, was singing gospel songs. And, and all of a sudden you think, ah, oh, Tom Jones has heard more about Jesus than I ever imagined. You imagine somebody on that show said to him, oh, come on, Jones, what did you hear about Jesus when you were a boy? And you would've, he would have gone he would have gone. But he might have said, oh, no, I don't want any more of that to do now. And you would then move on. You go, oh, fine. You, you, you don't have to force it, you see. Jesus and a question. And it's just normal. And, I, and you know, actually, the biggest challenge in our churches is at that point where there is a cowardly way out or a courageous way in, most of us take the cowardly way out. And why? Because our culture now intimidates us, makes us feel awkward, weird, odd, unacceptable. But last year, uh, there was a whole load of research done about people's openness to spiritual conversations. And it found that one in five adult Brits, seven million, were willing to have a conversation about Jesus and spiritual things. That is phenomenal. If you think one in five people are willing to have a conversation, okay, four out of five will say, no, not interested. But one in five might be. And we need to say to our folks, the people out there are more willing to hear about Jesus than you think they are. The problem is often in the heads of the Christians. Some of you have heard me say this before about invites. Don't say people's no for them. You might be surprised how many people go, oh, thanks for asking. Or, yes, I... I, this is what I think. Now, you have to do a lot of listening. But we do need to do some equipping for go and tell. Right, move on fast. Uh, where we go next? Yeah, just think about this then. So if we're going to help people, 
I just want to stress this. We need to give people permission to build those relationships. We need to people, give people that sense of, look, you're playing sport on a Saturday. That's great. Or you're, you're involved in a chess club on a Tuesday night. That's great. This is what Mark Green said. I think this is very, very important, this. Uh, next one, please. Too often the mission becomes to recruit the people of God to use some of their leisure time to join the missionary initiatives of church-paid workers. That is a phenomenal insight. We slip into this without knowing we're doing it. We want to develop some ministry. We want to develop some outreach. We want to develop some events. And we think, like, come on, church, please, we need some help to make these things happen. Give us some of your time. Run mums and toddlers, do this, do that. And that's right. But, you know, we've got to be careful that we, we say, like, you are the troops to join the things that we leaders are planning for you. And he says, that's too shriveled a view of what God is doing. We can end up being cross about those men who work in London because they never bring any of their friends to anything we do as a church. What? Hold on a minute. Whose empire are we building here? And that, that's a great danger because we want to see our church. And we know most of us, honestly, never think, even if even church gets to three, four hundred people, it's still incredibly fragile. Do you know what I mean? You know that when you're a church, if you're a church of 30, 40 people, you know how fragile it is. But it's always fragile. And because we're self-defensive inside our deepest psyches, it can be a defense mechanism. Like, come on, give more to our church to make sure our church is strong. Hold on a minute. We always embrace weakness. We've got to embrace our weakness and our vulnerability and our sense that we're fragile because then the power of God rests on people like us. Was if we think we're something, look at us, wow, well, it's hopeless, isn't it? And, and, and we mustn't fall in for a deep-seated psychological need to feel safe to get those people out there to give me another hour during their midweek time to do something at church when actually we need to give them permission to build some relationships out there with people far from God. And we need to affirm when they work Sometimes say, look, your work's taking you abroad, we'll pray for you. Not, oh, when are you back? See? So often the body language, isn't it, is negative when we could say, we'll pray for you. If God has taken you abroad, you may be going to somewhere where you meet people and never hear about Jesus. We'll pray for you. That kind of weird thing. How many non Christians do you speak to on a regular basis? You say, I don't know, right? Maybe at church, maybe the ten. Any teacher in your culture in your church taking an assembly will speak to ten times more non Christians than you do. But you never pray for her. Is that weird? Because that's the problem we've got into. It's church-based evangelism. There is a place for that, of course, you see. Come and see. Go and get care and serve. But there's, we need to give people permission. I'm really behind you. Who can I pray for in that chess club or your neighbourhood watch scheme or whatever it is you're involved in the community? You're there as one of God's people reaching People who I never would otherwise know. We need to give lots of permission for that. And we need to recognise, next one, that this is taking time. It's taking time. Who wouldn't love a multi-millionaires to get converted the very first time you preach in a church plant? You'd love that. Wouldn't you love that? I'd love that. But that's rare, isn't it? And today, most people's journey to faith, from first contact with a Christian so coming to become a Christian is about 10 years minimum. So all of the, a lot of church plants, which is great, you have to say, don't despair. You're likely to reap fruit just at the time when you feel like giving up. Because converts, and even if you see some converts in those first year or two, when you dig down deep, you realise you're reaping somebody else's hard work most of the time. Because it takes time most people are on a process from knowing nothing and being totally far from God. It takes a whole series of journeys to get to that point like Lydia where you like, I now hear and understand and believe. Now sometimes you see it incredibly rapidly. But actually most converts today, you get them telling their stories and they'll say, oh I had a great auntie I think prayed for me when I was a child. I had a friend at school who 
talked to me about Jesus, didn't understand a word of it. And then some wacky CU group at uni tried to tell me about Jesus, but I wasn't interested. But then I had a boss in my first job, and he was amazing. And I poured out my heart to him one day, and he said, come along with me to the church. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, that church sees this person. The boss brings a guy from work, and he gets converted that week. But no, 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 it's been a 15-year journey. That's, that's more how it happens. So you say to people, hang on in there. Don't just get used to, oh, well, they're never going to believe in Jesus. Don't, don't say that. You, who, who is God and who is the servant? Are you his servant? Say, Lord, use me where I am. Now, today, the, the, uh, the landscape on the back of your uh, handouts. Can you see this landscape thingy? I think uh, this is from Mark Mittelberg, this one. You got this one with the, can we do the picture? Uh, the church, this is, this is a castle in Wales, this is a church, is it a castle? This is how most people feel about church, it's forbidding. If, they, if I get in, they'll never let me out, and I can't get anyway because of massive great drawbridge. So Mark Mittelberg did this little diagram, this is about 20 years ago, and he said, look, we are used to the navigator's bridge diagram. And we need to teach people that, because that's a really helpful way for visual learners uh, the bridge diagram is just very helpful to say, oh right, I can see it now. Uh, we had two guys in our church converted, both are in the visual, one is a painter and the other is a graphic designer, and both converted when they saw that. They'd heard the gospel many times, but they're visual learners. But he says the landscape is not just the chasm between us and God, the chasm of sin. There's also now, for most people, the church is like a citadel that occasionally lets its drawbridge down. Then there's the great chasm of the moat, which is the chasm of culture. The culture in church and the culture in the world is so incredibly different now. It's like it feels like a, a great big ditch. And then there are these walls, these what Keller calls defeater beliefs. The people who are like, it, Christianity can't be true because. You know. And there's a whole series of those. Def- and, and where are people? And they're not just on their own. They live in culture, society, way beyond all that lot. Now, this is the good news. Where do your Christian members, where do they live? Where do they move and have their being? They're over here, aren't they? This is where they are. They are amongst these people. They are doing the vital work of befriending these people who think the only people who are my friends are all non-believers. And then they meet a believer and go, ah. Oh. And the believer has some opportunity to knock down one or two of these barriers, not completely demolish them, but so enough for somebody to like, oh, curdle over. And then the, then the events that the church runs, we fill in a bit of cultural gap. So we were hearing last night, there's phenomenal freedom, isn't there, about dress code. About the only thing about dress code in the New Testament is modesty. And even that's hard to pin down sometimes, or it's modest. But it's a, so we don't dress like our forefathers, we dress like our contemporaries. Because we want to fill in, there's no point in creating a barrier when you don't need a barrier. We use language that's intelligible. We use tunes that at least, oh, okay, 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 yes, all right. Because it's, it's an indifferent thing, isn't it? A tune is an indifferent thing. There is absolutely nothing in the Bible that says you must do it this way or that way. Volume is almost an indifferent thing. So we fill in a bit of that. And then we let down the drawbridge and show them that the church is not a citadel after all. It's a family which welcomes people. And then we may get the opportunity. Now let me tell you the really good news. See? But that, to get along that journey, these days, probably 10 years. And all the way along that journey, you need to be encouraging people. Keep praying, but not on your own. Share in your home group, share in the church. Who are you rubbing shoulders with that I could be praying for? And by the grace of God, some people may be making these journeys. And you need to talk that language. Because most people say, well, I talked to them about Jesus. They weren't interested. Give up. Bennett found, he found one lady. He got invited 14 years to a carol service and said no. And on the 15th year, she said yes. And three months later, she became a Christian. And he asked the question, how many of you would persevere with 14 no's? Uh, Well, I would give up after two, I think. That's it. They're not interested. Well, God was at work. And that lady's gracious perseverance paid off. We need to tell them that. It's a process. And so this one. So the landscape is a difficult landscape for us today, and the process takes time. Christians in sp- uh, no uh, Christian vision for men use this uh, analogy of a, a plane coming into land, and they talk about uh, building friendships, and then a friendship with a kind of taster, 
kind of maybe a short testament. Then, then a seeker uh, who's coming regularly reading something, maybe having one-to-one Bible study, maybe even coming to church, maybe coming to a Christian Explore course, and then landing safely. But the landing safely... Um, I was driving past Heathrow uh, on Saturday and it happened to me the very first time in my life I could see five planes with their lights on stacked up I, I counted four before I've got five and you, know, you shouldn't be doing that I know when you're driving around the M25 <laughs> but, but I couldn't help because I thought I could see five planes stacked up the journey to land at Heathrow starts 20 miles out and for people to land safely in the family of God, they're going to start off your radar. They start where your ordinary members are, praying for them. And then they say, oh, right, I've been praying for my neighbour for 10 years. I, I haven't told you that. And she said she'd come to the carol service this week. And you go, oh, that's that. See, and that's what needs to be encouraged in church. If churches want to grow, that's, what, that's the culture that needs to change, isn't it? And people need to go, oh, right. So spending this caring, loving, connecting with non-Christians way over there is not at the expense of doing it. It's not either spend time with non-Christians or spend time with Christians. It's both and, always both and, not either or. But we do need to encourage that. Because most of us like to play safe and it's easy to play safe with Christians. And remember, we're all on a team together. Quite often you find this. This is a, uh, you come across, what's the greatest sport of all? It's not hockey. It's not, not the sport. It's rugby. Why? Because you need the fat and the thin and the long and the tall to play rugby. You can't play rugby with one body shape. You can football. You can hockey. You can snoot. You know, but you can't in rugby. You just need a variety for the team to play well. And so it is when people become Christians. Very few of us... Meet an individual and lead that person on our own to faith in Christ. We are on the job together. And that's God's design. We get to be part of this. So even if it's not necessarily your friend who comes, it is our friend. You see? So it's a we mentality, not a me mentality. And I think rugby encourages that above all. Right, a fine thing. Where's your role in this as a church leader? What's your role? Well, you lead by example. Heibel's in one of his uh, little lectures says this. If you can't say follow me with integrity, game over. Follow me. Follow. He said your followers take their cue from you at every level. How sincere should I be? How patient should I be? How exuberant should I be? How gracious should I be? How passionate should I be? They will take their cue from you. And if you just exhort people to evangelism, but never talk about anybody you know, they'll get the lesson, actually, it's a mugs game. The really cool Christians just exhort people to evangelize other people. I went to a church once, they had an invite thing and we took some friends because we knew the speaker well and what I noticed was that virtually all the elders and deacons were running the event but nobody had friends at the event and I, immediately I said to myself uh-oh that's bad you guys and girls you should be at the forefront of having friends here because actually the whole of the church if they say it's more important to do something to run the event than to get somebody to the event They'll go, I'll volunteer to help run the event. Now, that's not unimportant. But actually, getting people to the event is the hard bit. And we need to lead by example. Now, it's very hard, isn't it, in a busy life? There's a time when I knew no non-Christians only through my wife Jenny's friends. And something had to change. I had to get to know guys my age and stage. That's why, partly why I started playing sport. But it might be for you something else. I don't know what it is. It might be park run on a Saturday. It might be chess club. It might be something where you just meet people and you say, please pray for my friends who I've invited to the carol service. Lead by example. The second thing, energy. It is tiring. We have a young guy in our church now working for us who's helping lead a lot of this stuff. And after about six months, he said, Ray, I had no idea. You just have, It's like an energy sink, isn't it? You have to put so much energy constantly because it's tons of disappointments and tons of 
blind alleys and lots of eventual no's and and things that look so obvious. <laughs> like, that's the that is what it's like. It is just tiring. And somehow you need to find strength in God to pour strength into this because this goes down the agenda because it's hard, isn't it? Pretty much everything else in life, church life is hard, but this is the hardest because it at times seems so slow, so unrewarding, so disappointing. I told him, John, you've joined a job where it's all about disappointment management. Did you know that? And he really, I said, look, John, for every one that comes back, there were nine that said, thanks for healing me, Jesus, but no thanks. Only one came back and said, thank you to God. So that's going to be like that, John. That's the nature of, it, of the thing. It's tiring. And it's hard because it's a choice thing, isn't it? You only have limited time, limited energy. You can't do everything. How do you make a bias to choose to spend time with people who don't come to church when you're responsible to look after the people that do come to church? Mrs. Keller said, Redeemer Church was founded with a desire to reach those who don't come to church. And to keep that at the top of the agenda is difficult to the point of being nearly impossible. It's so difficult because so many people in the church are needy and they need your help. And yet you have to say we are a church on mission. And you just have to have something of that 1 Corinthians 9 passion about you, don't you? And you know if you do that, you can't do that. And that's hard because you know there's always work to be done. You have to make an intentional bias. I remember Jeff Thomas so helpfully helping years ago. He encouraged younger ministers, bias towards the people coming towards faith. When they come to your church, bias towards spending time with them. Bias towards being on courses. You help take those courses where you meet your, your, your ne- bias. I know, you said, I know some of the older saints will feel neglected, but if you want to see the church reach people, you have to bias towards those folks. And you will be misunderstood. What is the cost? You will be misunderstood. There's times when you spend time with non Christians and the Christians will misunderstand. They will feel neglected. And yet there's something about it saying, look, we're not neglecting you. It's just that I can't provide all the care you require. I am not your chaplain. I am part of a pastoral team in the church. Now that is a really tightrope, difficult one to walk. And yet, and yet there will be people in heaven because, humanly speaking, we bias that way because we've put that as an emphasis. So there's some thoughts about trying to create a culture which helps grow a church. Thank you very much for being so patient. Ray, thank you very much. Okay. That is, has been most helpful and uh, so uh, full of real life and, and with a good sense of humor, but biblically based, coming from the, the book of Acts, which I sometimes find like uh, is more exciting to read than the most <laughs> exciting thriller you can read, in my view. <laughs> so, thanks very much. There is time, maybe, if, if you've got time yeah. for um, a couple of quick questions. There's, of course, time later this afternoon, but we have time for couple now. Yes, please. Sorry, what's the state of question? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting we said about much of cars while being so frightening. The state is, has anyone thought that I'm on the mission field here? Is that, sorry, I missed that. Has anyone thought you're actually on the mission field here? Mm. I've just spoken to a lady in the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, Roger's brilliant at those kind of things, isn't he? Mm-hmm. And we could be, if we had our sense, our radar up, we'd recognise that God is a work around us all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other? Well, perhaps. Yeah, yes, Michael. Um, thank you, Ray. By the way, I noticed you did use the word appreciation. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I had it in my mind. You see, it was, it was, it was gurgling around. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a very hard one, isn't it? I mean, sometimes that will be dependent a little bit on size dynamics. There is a no question that you know if you're a single paid pastor of a church of about sixty, uh, you won't have a whole network. You may have one or two people good at helping you, but if you're a pastor of a church of three or four hundred, you will have to get organised. There's just no way you you can't be sliced three hundred times. So somewhere between 60 up to 300, you, 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 there's something about how do I organise pastoral care, not just me personally provide pastoral care. Now, sometimes you've grown a team of elders or you may have grown a team of staff workers. You may have a whole load of home group leaders. And, and what you need to say is, look, first layer of pastoral care is from other Christians in your home group and maybe you can talk to a home group leader. A bit, a bit the Jethro thing, you know, leader of 10, leader of 50. Uh, and that's a hard transition to make. So one of the hardest things in my life is that I, I, I was very closely committed as the pastor of a fairly sort of small to medium-sized church where I knew everybody. They all knew me. I knew all their names, knew all their kids' names. I knew pretty much a lot of it. <clears throat> Those people who were there back then still think like, Ray, they were the good old days. <laughs> now we don't see you so much now. And that is a really difficult transition to make. If you come in at a church of 300 people, you don't expect to see one pastor whereas you would if you were in a church of 60 and it's just a case of explaining that we use a family analogy quite often you know it, now most of us these days have small families this is fine but my dad was one of 15 and every time a new baby came along his mum had to spend time with the mum the baby and the toddlers mm. and, the, and the older children had to look after the younger children while well, she spent more of her time with the baby and the toddlers. So my dad hardly knew his oldest brother. He'd already left home by the time my dad got to eight. You know, he'd gone. He'd already married and, and off he'd gone. And, and, and so is that less of a family? No, it's, a, it's just a big family organising slightly differently from a, a family that has only two children. So using that analogy, saying, look, it's not that we don't love you, but you're being looked after. Now you're slightly older, more mature, so that we can look after the sort of the very young lambs, if you like, in the flock. But also know that every now and then some of the old sheep have got themselves on their backs and are going to die unless they need a bit of help. So, do you know what I mean? So it's not, again, it's not only that, it's both and, but it is a bio, and, and, and you would know, a mother would do that, wouldn't she? A, a mother would have to spend time with a baby and toddler, but of course she's still going to talk to a 14-year-old about the boyfriend that's just dumped her. But, so you, by using that analogy a little bit, people go, okay, I understand. they understand that language, you see. Whereas if, they talk, if you talk about organisation, like we have an organisation here and you know, you're in group 3AB and you're number 456, <laughs> people hate that, and don't, shouldn't they? They should hate that. So you may have to organise it, but don't use organisational language. That's re- people that t- so you use family language, even though you're organised. Does that help a little bit? Really, okay. thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much.